Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our virtual small business workshop today. And I definitely want to thank Spectrum Reach for joining us. I think we've got a good presentation for you today. Uh, Kristen Lundbeck is uh, going to be presenting shortly. Kristen's waving there in the uh, the top. This is actually our first uh, go to webinar webinar, which is redundant when you say it like that. But um, so we're uh, experimenting with some of the new features and everything. But you should be able to see us uh, on the top of the screen uh, as well as the uh, presentation below us. Uh, if you're having any problems hearing us right now, if you'll let us know in the chat box, that would be great. Um, well, uh, before I turn it over to Kristen, just some uh, housekeeping things. Uh, obviously, this is one of those uh, member benefits that uh, we like to do here at the Chamber to uh, keep you in the loop on just different opportunities that are out there for you. Certainly, right now, we're all looking about how are the best ways to get our message out for our business, our organization, what have you. Uh, I think this is, presentation today is going to give you a lot of good ideas and how you can do that. Uh, if you have questions or comments during the presentation, either put them in the question window or the chat window. Uh, I'll be looking over those as we go through. And then when we get towards the end of the presentation, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and moderate that uh, for you today. Uh, looks like nobody's having any issue with the audio, so that's good news. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. And uh, Kristen, take it away. Thank you, Doug. And Good morning and good afternoon, actually, now, everybody. Uh, welcome to my home office, um, as I'm sure many of you guys are adjusting. Um, I, I always like to start, just in case you don't know, uh, Spectrum Reach, specifically, is the advertising arm of uh, Spectrum Communications. So uh, many people know us for being your cable or internet provider or, or one that's available in your market. Um, but kind of what we do specifically is, is the part that works with uh, businesses or ad agencies to uh, help you get your message in front of the right audience and help come up with marketing solutions for you. So my, my role within Spectrum Reach, I'm the Director of Advanced Advertising. Um, I call that the artist formerly known as digital um, because we used to call it digital and then suddenly things got really blurry because everything was the internet. Um, and so we came up with the, the creative name of advanced advertising. Sorry, right, I'm gonna look to the slide to find my arrow to make sure I'm clicking in the right direction. Um, so you all signed up today to talk about data, which is very exciting. And I, I joke a little with this cartoon, but um, it gets to the heart of how I think everyone uh, may feel about talking about this topic, which is I should really know maybe a little bit more about data, or I feel like this is really important and I feel like this is something I should talk about a lot, um, but maybe it's not something that's a part of, of your everyday. So today we're not going to go really, really deep because we know that uh, you all are coming from, I'm sure, many different positions, many different roles. Um, and to just kind of give you the, the 101 on how marketers uh, are, are using data to make better marketing decisions and, and drive better business outcomes um, for their organization. So I get really excited about data and hopefully you do too, but we're not gonna nerd out too much. Um, we're, I'm gonna try to keep this in, in the form of stories and, and things that you can all relate to and, and uh, not talk too much jargon. If I do, you go ahead and go in that chat pod and, and <laughs> make sure to call out uh, any acronym that I say that you don't at all recognize. Uh, there will also be some trivia at the end. So fun trivia games uh, to play along. In person, I would probably have, you know, things to throw out to you, but we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, let me start with what is data? And whenever you're talking marketing data, it really comes down to these two different things, first party data and third party data. And if you understand that, you understand a lot about the foundation of, of how you would use these different things and apply them to your business. So first party at its core really means that it was a one-to-one -one relationship between who created that data and who's collecting the data. So some examples that, that you can all live. Uh, shopper behavior is very common. So whenever you go to the, the grocery store um, and you scan your little rewards card so that you can get your uh, 25 cent savings, uh, what you're doing right there is saying, here's, here's my card. That tells you that 
I'm Kristen Lundbeck. Um, when I buy this dog food, it tells you something about me. So over time, um, me and that, that grocery store develop this first party data. They know all of the different things that I'm buying. And that becomes an insight with enough frequency. So if um, my grocery store sees that I buy dog food once a week, it is pretty safe for them to assume that I have a dog, um, that there's a dog in my home that I'm buying things for. So shopper behavior data is one of the most common forms of data that we're all creating every day and that we all use to make better decisions for our products and services. Um, if there's any gamblers out there, your casino cards. Uh, when I, I know that my you know, $3 bets uh, are not gonna get me a free room in Las Vegas. But uh, when you're using a gambling car card, same idea, you're telling that casino, uh oh, I guess I might have lost my display. Uh, you're telling that casino what games you play, how much you tend to bet, um, if you're willing to come back, or if you're uh, a member of other facilities. Let me, I'm going to ask Doug, are you guys having trouble seeing my screen? I'm getting some bouncing back and forth. Yeah, it looks like it's bouncing back to the uh, just the main PowerPoint thing. I don't know if there's a okay. weird click or something happening on on your end or not. Weird, there, there is. I see it happening. I didn't know if it was happening for you. So I am just going to try to. You guys will get your preview. Um, I'm going to stick in this mode and hopefully that that doesn't have the kind of flickering back and forth. Um, oh, that should work. We'll see. When I did that, it worked, so we shall see. So, Casino Club. Um, the kind of data that my company deals with the most um, is what we call set-top box viewership data. Um, so think beyond the consumer purchases that make a ton of sense for all of us to understand. Um, but at Spectrum, one of the ways that we're helping make better marketing decisions is learning what our customers on like the cable side of our business are actually viewing. So if you're a cable subscriber, let's say you have a, a box that you, you, you uh, tune into different channels. And what that's doing is collecting a whole lot of information about your viewership. It tells us what households watch. It tells us it, it, it can tell us um, the profile of who we think is in the household based on what they're watching. Um, and this is beyond set-top box data is a powerful tool that we have with cable, but you know that's true of Netflix, it could be true of uh, your Amazon Prime. Um, all of these companies are really good at saying, this is what you were watching before. What does that tell you about your house? And for marketers, um, or if you're thinking about making a awareness campaign, let's say, and, and you know a little about your audience, that data can be very powerful for you to make sure that your message is getting in front of the right person who's watching the right type of content. So that's all data that consumers are creating, uh, companies are collecting, and as long as you're the company collecting it, that means it's first party data. Third party data is the use of that first party data by another company. So frequently this is used for things like mailing lists. Um, if I am Purina dog food, and full disclosure, dog food is my example, but I don't have a dog. So if Purina doesn't even exist anymore as a brand, I have no idea. Um, but they must have good brand recognition because I always think of them. So if you're a Purina and you want to do a mailing, um, one of the things that you will likely do is look for uh, an organization or a data house that has access to that shopper behavior data and say, says, tell me the households that you have that buy dog food every single week. How do I get in front of those households? Um, and so it's the use of that data, the, the example, and, and then it makes their message more relevant. It makes sure that they can take a mailing list that might have been, where's my hand, that big, and it makes it that big, um, and that's saving you money to invest elsewhere in your marketing mix. Um, the, the good personal example I had with this with shopper behavior is I have two kids, they're four and six now, um, but for a period of time, I um, used formula and was buying formula. So clearly that I never signed up for a mailing list, I never signed up for anything, but my shopper data had to be going somewhere because suddenly during that period of time, um, about every week I would get some sort of mailer with a coupon for formula. 
sometimes the brand I was buying, sometimes other brands. So other brands were saying, hey, you know, this, a person who's going to buy formula is in a really specific uh, period of their life. And it's a point in time kind of purchase. We really have to strike while the iron's hot um, to get that person to buy my type of formula. So there's a great example of those brands using that first party data, but using it in a different way. So think about for yourself how your brands might use someone else's or how you might collect your own information. And, you know, this, like I said, this goes beyond shopper data. So just to give you a couple other examples or to think about how you're creating your own data in your day to day. Um, every time you build a playlist, whether you use Spotify or Pandora or Amazon Music, any of those, what they're doing is curating for you based on the data that they get. What songs do you play? What songs do you search? What songs do you request? What songs do you thumbs up if that's the platform? Um, all of that is feeding information to, to that service about you. Um, that service is then saying, okay, we have this group of people who listens to similar music and does similar things. They probably have similar interests and that becomes really valuable marketing information. Uh, same thing with shopping. Shopping goes beyond making a purchase. Uh, shopping can also include what you're just browsing around for. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting dinner conversation often is that increasingly people are saying, I think my phone is listening to me because I have never talked about X, Y, Z topic, or I, I've never even brought this up. And then suddenly I started seeing ads for it. So some degree, um, there are some services that, you know, have audio on and are capturing information about audio that you're speaking. But more often what's happening is that you were likely meeting a profile uh, based on your other shopping behavior that gave some indication that you would be a good fit for something. And then, once you talk about it, it's top of mind. And so you start to see those messages more often. Not that in, in some cases, they were always there. You just didn't see them because it wasn't top of mind. So there are, the list can go on and on about the ways that we are personally creating data every single day. How businesses are using it uh, changes and evolves every single day as well. Uh, for many of you, your businesses might already be using data in ways that you're not thinking of. Um, so it could be that it's just not your role to do this kind of thing, or it could be that it, it didn't occur to you. Um, realtors often will, will think if you're an individual realtor thinking about marketing your services, you're not necessarily thinking about what the, uh, I think this might be uh, Keller Williams or, you know, your, your realty company is doing for you behind the scenes. But rest assured, they're using a ton of data to make sure that the listings within their organization are getting in front of people who could be uh, the right kind of potential buyer because they wanna make sure that they're not um, being inefficient with how they're spending their money and how they're marketing their services. And there's a house for everybody, so getting the right house in front of the right person. Uh, many businesses are also really savvy with this when it comes to recruitment. Um, recruiting has been ahead of this game for a long time. Um, one of the enablers of that is that uh, resumes, the way that we kind of put information out about ourselves is usually in the written word format. And that's really easy when you get it into a digital space to read or really for computers and technology to read who can sort through all of that information a lot quicker than our brains could, or if we had a stack of papers that, you know, we're going through. Uh, what data is able to do is sort resumes, sort postings, sort listings, so that it gets in front of the right people. Uh, if you check my LinkedIn, you'll see that prior to joining Spectrum Reach, I, uh, I worked for CVS Health, um, and Many of you guys may be familiar with their extra care card. Um, more often, what you might be familiar with are hilarious memes about the length of CVS receipts. Um, so here's just a cute one about it replacing a blind, but uh, the CVS extra care card, I, I wanna talk about the way that shopper data is applied for them. So thinking about what the business is, what challenge they have that they're trying to overcome, and then how they use data to overcome that challenge. So if you think of CVS or whatever your local kind of pharmacy drugstore uh, location is, 
one of the things about their retail locations is that you don't go to CVS for all the things. You go there for the thing. You know, I, I need cotton balls to take off my nail polish. I'm out of those. So I'm going to run to CVS and get that one thing. So what CVS is challenged to do is to get that person who came in to buy one thing to buy three things, let's say, to, to increase their average ticket every time they walk in the door. Because they know that the reason people choose their locations and why they choose their physical locations is all about convenience. Um, so availability of that um, makes it the quick stop kind of location. So through extra care, what they're able to do or what they're trying to do all the time is say, based on your previous purchase history, based on everything that we think we know about you or that you've told us, here are really relevant offers for you. Um, and they couple that with great pricing incentives. So a different part of your marketing mix is your price. Um, so how do they give $5 off this, $10 off that, whatever, really uh, deeper discounts to say, oh, that is a good deal. I'm going to either go to CVS again when I wasn't planning on it, or I'm going to spend more next time I go into the CVS location. So thinking about the important thing to take away is how they thought about what is it when we get a customer in the door, what is it that we actually really want them to do? Um, and how do we use our data to make a smart marketing plan to get them back in the door? And how do we give you long receipts? So the, here's some other examples of uh, companies that use this data to make better marketing choices for you. Um, Fandango, where you can buy uh, movie tickets. Fandango knows or pro likely knows that I have two young children or that I love animated movies, one or the other. But either way, they can market to me in a different way. And that could be um, more movies, early previews, locking in seats, you know, if it's access to the door, whatever that might be. Starbucks knows that I order differently from the morning to the afternoon um, when I'm driving through or, or mobily ordering. And because of that, can make unique offers to me. They know my birthday, so I feel special, so I get free drinks. Uh, they know a lot that builds a relationship with me, and they use that to kind of create a conversation with uh, when I would come in, what my store locations are, there's lots of different applications for how they use that. So again, every industry is different and knowing that I'm sure you guys come from uh, many different places and represent different roles in your organizations, it's hard to say exactly what that could be. But the point is, start with your end in mind and go from there with your data. Um, but I have to address. So as we're talking about all the different ways that companies can collect information about you, uh, if the population is any indication, it is safe to say that some percentage of you on this call right now are going, is that legal? Like, do I want people to be collecting this data about me? And this is a real concern. It's a concern beyond uh, marketers. Usually it's outside of marketers. Usually it's uh, it's in our government right now. It's kind of all over popular news about legality of this. And one of the things that I always pose is think about what you would personally give up or, or the benefits that you actually gain as a consumer um, from data that is collected about you and how it can make your life easier. Um, I'll give you a couple examples where data is being used and it's making my life a little bit better and I don't know if I would give it up. Uh, I check the weather uh, most mornings. And I use my weather, I think weather.com app. And in the rare cases that for whatever reason, it is not set, preset to my suburb, I'm very annoyed. Like, oh, I have to go all this time, I have to go back in and, and reset my location to get accurate weather. Or even worse, if I just took it for what it was and read the weather in the wrong city and it, you know, throws off your apparel for the day and you're ill prepared. Um, when you, travel. We will one day, I swear. Um, when you or when I did travel, I think of a trip I went on to Vegas a couple years ago. And what your your phone is smart enough to do and what the different venues and restaurants and uh, companies in Las Vegas are smart enough to do is recognize when someone's visiting and start to serve ads to that person. It recognizes that your device is here. And now I can say, come try this restaurant, come see this show. When you're there, 
that's a nice benefit to have because you may not otherwise be exposed to some things that you might go and check out. Um, frequent, uh, if you travel, uh, your favorite route, um, it could be your home location. I do travel a lot normally. So uh, knowing that my base airport is always plugged in, I don't have to redo that. That small time saving is very valuable to me, but that's all based on data that we're collecting and using. Um, so think about, you know, what did it, what value do you get from it? And the other thing that I would say to give you all peace of mind is all of this first and third party data that we collect as mark, collect and use as marketers does not come through for usage in the way that I think many people view it, which is that it is going to come through at when I make my purchase, if I was Gina Santos, um, it's going to come through and say, who I am, how old I am, what my kids' names are, all of this very personal information about me. In reality, that's not ever what gets passed through, um, both for legal reasons and, to be honest, it's, it's irrelevant in many cases to marketers. Unless I need your home, I, I'm doing a mailing, I need your home address and your name for things like that, that becomes important. But one-to-one -one marketing like that is is rarely done outside of a database that, that you have about your customers where it probably feels very appropriate for you to have a relationship, use someone's name, and talk to them. When we're talking broader about getting in front of new people and new audiences, what you're going to see, what, what marketers see come through instead is a 35 to 45 year old female um, who loves coffee, shops on Amazon, has kids, drives a Ford, um, and watches these kind of shows. I will say that I didn't put this slide together, but this like, my name isn't Gina Santos, but or Santos, but it, it eerily is, is me. But that is kind of what happens is as a marketer, I'm looking for many people that look like this. Many people group together that I can get my message in front of. So there's many uh, 35 to 45 year old female mothers who drink coffee where my message is gonna be really relevant. And so that's how your, your data or the data that you're using gets anonymized and kind of sorted to make it useful for you. Um, then there's some decisions to make around how do you use that to actually target your audiences. Um, Oftentimes when people think about building your brand or driving a marketing message, one of the big goals that they have is they want something as awesome as brand recognition, like the Gecko Geico, or everybody knows who Walmart is. And um, I'm in Finley, there are taglines, I'm sure, of people that everyone locally will know. We all know the end of someone's jingle. And that is an awesome aspiration to have to building your brand. Um, but that takes a long time. It takes consistency over a number of years, and that is a great goal. Um, but a great place to start is to get a bit more hyper targeted. And I use the word hyper, but it's you know think of think of the example of the woman that we just had. That's not crazy hyper. Um, we're not saying that she's left-handed and she shops on Tuesdays and she you know she does all of these things. These are relatively broad strokes. But what it does is helps you get efficiencies for your marketing budget. Because if you can't afford to talk to everybody and make sure that everybody knows who the Gecko Geico is and drive that message home enough times for people to really remember it uh, and sing the jingle before they go to bed at night, what you can do is start uh, with who your core audience is and find more of those. Politicians, we're, we're ramping up for a, a big political season. but uh, political campaigns have known this for years, and marketers should apply the same concept. If you're a politician who's on the far left or the far right, uh, you don't generally go after the other end of the spectrum when you're looking for votes. It's too hard. You look at how do I inch a little bit closer to the people who align with wherever I am. And, and, you know, if you're in the middle, you kind of go like this on, on both ends of that, or if you're on either end of the spectrum. And, and the same thing is true when we're thinking about developing marketing plans. Who, look at your audience base. Who are they today? And then if I wanted to expand just a little bit, let's say this is a, a bad example, but if they were 35 to 37, well, could we get the 38-year-olds? Maybe we should go a little bit broader than that. Um, that's a 
really specific example, but for your own businesses, think about what that looks like and how you go a little bit broader than where you are today. And then use data. Because now imagine saying something like, I want to grow my business, I want to grow my base, to who and to what end, and not really knowing the answer to that question. So think about and start with, where do I want to grow my business? Or where do I want to focus my attention? What data do I have that could inform what happens and then build a campaign around that? Um, to give you an example of what we do or what I do uh, when partnering with businesses, is the, these are kind of the names of the different tools that we have within our company. But at the core, what all of them do are start with what data do we have underneath those? So Audience App is our tool to look at viewership data. What are people watching on television? Addressability is looking at our internet households. So what are the internet households in the area doing? What are they watching? What data do we have about them? Audience track is a, a reporting dashboard, but it also tells us what happened in the past. When, when we've run campaigns that were in the same industry or the same geography or against the same target audience, what happened? Um, so we can look historically at what happened and use that data. Um, and then ads everywhere is streaming. So that's kind of the, the new version of TV and oftentimes it's a, a similar look, but slightly different at what viewership is. So for us, what we do when we partner with a business is say, here's all of our sources where we're, we can really gather some really great insights. If you wanna do X, Y, Z, uh, we're gonna look at all of these sources and try to help you come up with a solution. Um, so my, my advice, I guess, or, or key things to take away from knowing what data is, aside from sorting, is it first party, is it third party, what goal do you have? Um, Start with the end in mind. What do you really want to achieve? And then you don't have to be an expert in data to get access to experts or to get access to the data. Um, the other thing that I hear most often is that it, it can feel overwhelming. So there's all this great CVS shopper data. Great. Where would I even start to get something like that? Uh, the good news is that companies, like what, what we do and what companies like us do um, is make sure that that's accessible to our local business partners. And so uh, when we work with someone, what we're doing is saying, let us sort through all of that um, and get you a great output. So look for partners that can help you with that. The example I use a lot is, you know, I could do my own taxes every year. I could go online. I totally could figure it out. But Instead, uh, I work with a CPA who, who knows what the tax laws are. I drop something off. I come back. We chat a little. Um, he does the magic, and then I come back and sign, and it's a done deal. And I feel confident that I have a real expert working for me. Um, and so it, it's the same deal. If this feels overwhelming for you or your business, know that there's partners out there that can help you solve your problem. So I, I, will, I have some trivia questions. Um, I don't know. I think if you typed answers into the chat, that would work. But because it's WebEx, I'll just go ahead and say them. And you can, if you want to plug them in, go for it. So a grocery store sends you a, a custom coupon based on past purchases. Um, they track it through their store app and their club card. What kind of data is that? Now let's try putting it in the, uh, looks like uh, Joe put it in the questions. Joe says, first kelly says first oh we we have some smart listeners here yeah look at that all right you got it geico represents strong effective math or hyper targeting marketing strategies so oh, that's a good one joe's going with mass joe's on it it is math. You got it. When a re whoops, see, and just done. Well, I'll leave you with that. How about that? I won't fight through technology to get that last question. <laughs> so that's that's really all I have for you today. Um, would love to take any questions that you have. All right. I, again, if you want to put those in the question box or the chat box, uh, we'll go ahead and go through those. Um, I guess I'll I'll start off, Kristen. I think that's a, a lot of good information, and I think that's the world we're going to be living in for 
I think forever at this point uh, is you got to have this data to to put together a solid marketing plan. So if I'm a smaller business, um, yep. you know, maybe uh, maybe I'm a small restaurant, uh, maybe even a small nonprofit. What's the way maybe I dip my toes into getting into data driven marketing? Yeah, I think uh, an, an audit of what you have is like kind of step one. So what are your processes for collecting data today about um, your customers? So if you are or do you have a means to collect information? Let's say you're a restaurant. You know, do you have a loyalty club card? that in some way gets someone something. Is it their name? Is it their email address, home address? Just some more information that makes sure that you can continue to have a dialogue with that person. Um, sometimes a, a lot of companies are doing that with Facebook too, um, but I would say my only piece of advice there is think Facebook and beyond um, because within Facebook, you get what you get in that platform and you're kind of dependent on, on that person continuing to be there, listening to your message, uh, delivering your message. And I think uh, to go along with that, some of those uh, customer rewards programs where you can start to develop that data um, and, and not to have you talk about other platforms that aren't spectrum reach, but uh, for instance, when I go to Coffee Amici downtown here, I don't know that I signed up for, I probably did, but I know that anytime I run my card on their square, I, I believe they use square there, it pops up like, oh, you've, you, yeah, you're all eligible for a free coffee. So you don't necessarily have to build this from scratch. There, there are a lot of providers and you should probably look into your credit card uh, processor and that type of thing to see if they have those programs available. A hundred percent and square is a great example because they do have a lot of great powerful um, information for you to use if you're looking at it. And so then once you get that information, then I think that's probably when, and, and I think you can help develop that information too, but that's probably a good time to check in with Spectrum Reach or a provider like that once you want to start putting together your marketing, because then you have some data already to begin with, and you can go to really any advertiser at that point and be like, this is who's shopping here. I want to get more people like that. Here's my data. How can you help me? And uh, You got it. That way you're not getting such that, bro, oh yeah, we reach everybody. Because there's certainly a lot of people who tell you that they reach everybody. Reach everybody. Or who's your, mar we hear that a lot. Or who's your, you know, who's a good prospect for your business? Everybody. That's awesome. It is very expensive to talk to everybody. Um, so honing, and you know, we love that too. If it really is, we, we want to talk to everybody. We want to sell to everybody. Great. Um, but that comes with big budgets. And, you know, people are working on, tighter budgets these days a lot of times. Kelly says I stole her question. I'm sorry, Kelly. I didn't I didn't mean to steal your question. <laughs> uh, in terms of cost effectiveness of this, one, so one thing that you know, we talk about with, with chamber members right now, when the economy's down or when we're uncertain times, a lot of times people pull back advertising as a first response. And uh, I'm glad yeah. Kelly likes me, by the way. She just let me know. Um, but that's not necessarily a, a great plan because you got to let people know you're open. You want to let people know what your services are. You want to let people know just how you're operating and, and stay in contact with that. I have to imagine that having that data can really help you fine tune that message so that you don't feel like you have to tell everybody. You can just tell your core customer group and really communicate on that level. I have to imagine it's going to help you save money in the long run. Yeah, um, I think starting with your your core base or what data you have. Again, what we're seeing a lot right now, and you're right, people are kind of pulling back in, in, in some cases, or they need to tighten up a little bit based on current environment, and every industry is a little different. But um, that's one really great way to do it is maybe in, in a totally normal environment, you want to go bigger and you want to build your brand and you want to grow share. Um, and now you've had to pivot that strategy a little bit and say, we're really focused on maintaining our core business, um, securing that. We don't want to be bleeding anything out, out um, during this time. And so that's going to shift your, your strategy. And the better your data and the better you're utilizing that, um, the smarter your plan can be. But you also have something really important, which is uh, we, we have a ton of just advertising generally. Um, 
a ton of really great historic case studies of turbulent times and that brands that stay active to the extent that they can, and, and we know that times can be tough, but to the extent that you can stay active and continue to market your business, those businesses every single time in the long run have done uh, a lot better over the long term. So stay on where you can. <laughs> Definitely something to consider when, when you're putting together an amended budget for the rest of the year. Uh, I definitely mm -hmm. definitely want to take that into account. Um, not seeing any other questions just yet. Do want to remind you, uh, if, if you want the presentation from today, if you go to the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, you should be able to download that PDF. If you can't get it, let me know, and I'll email that out to you here uh, later this afternoon. Um, Kristen, I really want to thank you for, I think it's a lot of good information for people. I also like the stock photo of the person driving with their eyes closed because he looked way too happy <laughs> to be driving with, <laughs> and ride with that. He looked dangerous. So, uh, Kristen, if people want to get in touch with you and they have uh, questions beyond this, what's the best way to do that? Uh, so email is kristen.lundbeck. Uh, so spelling, I think, is under my name right there at charter.com. Um, or if you search for that name within LinkedIn, um, feel free to message me there, too. Or find uh, me. Well, thank you for your time today. I want to thank uh, everybody, uh, all of our members who hopped on uh, for today's webinar and for our, our small business workshops. Uh, again, we're probably going to be doing these virtually for the uh, foreseeable future. Interestingly, we had thought before all of this happened that we would start to do some online workshops this year just so we didn't have to have people taking so much time out of their day to uh, come to different events and everything like that we thought it'd be a, a fun experiment and um i i guess uh, that's just the way we're going to do things now uh but it seems to be working out well so again thanks to everybody for coming out today uh and i would love to tell you i know how to get out of these presentations easily so we'll uh, i'm just going to click x and if it's an awkward transition out Thanks everybody and, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.